Welcome to The Code of Life. I'm Randy Neal. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to look at our food industry in a completely different way. How many of us at the beginning of this pandemic suddenly had a desperate need to stockpile food and buy flour or yeast? Now, questions are being raised about our food supply chain and the necessity of creating sustainable food systems close to home and ethically sustainable food system. A big part of that food sustainability plan includes genomics, but not in the way you may think. Our two guests today are what you might call futurists, scientists using genomic technology to plan for the future of our food supply in a safe, ethical, and sustainable way. First, Dan Weary is a UBC professor who specializes in animal welfare um, and by studying how genomic modifications may, may benefit or harm them. And Lenore Newman is the director of the Food and Agriculture Institute at the University of the Fraser Valley and an author of two books who specializes in the future of food, what's sustainable and what isn't, including land use and policy. Welcome, Dan. Welcome, Lenore, to you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. <laughs> so I described you both at the beginning as food futurists. Do you agree with that? And, and how does that pertain to you, Dan? So in, in a way, nothing is more traditional than the practice of agriculture. And so we have this 10,000 year relationship with cows, for example. Uh, so in a way it's very traditional, but also in agriculture forever, there's been adoption of new technologies, often with a lot of pushback, uh, but often also with lots of successful adoption. So I think that's one of the interesting things here is just to see this genomic technologies is just one other type of technology and the issues around incorporating where and how to how to best incorporate technology into our food system. I definitely think it is a big part of what I do. Although, as Dan mentions, uh, I spend a lot of time looking at the past and what we have eaten over the last 10,000 years, uh, going right from when we were wrapping mammoth around sticks and roasting it in front of fires to a future where maybe we will be cloning uh, mammoth cells and wrapping them around sticks and putting them on fires. So sort of the whole arc of history, but a lot of my work does ask the question, what will be for dinner tomorrow? You talk um, a lot about it, about cellular technology and the way we eat will be our cellular agriculture and the way we eat a century from now will be vastly different than what we do now. What do you mean by that? And give us an example. Yes. Well, I truly believe we're entering a period of incredible change in the food system that is on par with the change 10,000, 8,000 years ago when we first moved to farming and animal agriculture in an organized way, in that we're gaining the technologies to produce incredible amount of foods indoors and uh, in many cases without the animals involved. And uh, cellular agriculture focuses on producing animal products without the animal directly. There are still a few animals here and there in the system, but uh, it uh, is things, for example, like growing a burger in a vat, which is very difficult, um, but a lot of people are working on it. It's and expensive too. It's very expensive, it, yeah. although as most technologies, it's getting cheaper and cheaper. And the one I specialized in is uh, creating dairy without the cow, which is a much easier technological problem and is now cheap enough that it is coming into the range where it can compete with, um, with dairy. And it's also an interesting category because animal-derived dairy is already competing with plant-derived dairy. And now there's a new kid on the block, which we call yeast-derived dairy in our group. And why is that important to, to move away from a dairy-based product into like a cellular milk product? Well, I definitely have personal reasons, but also from a sustainability point of view, we are seeing an explosion of interest in dairy products around the world. And uh, we are having a terrible time scaling that system to meet demand. We're seeing these super dairies of up to 100,000 cows in China. And uh, around the world, uh, sometimes in the tropics where cows don't do that well, and the emissions from these are kind of shocking. And uh, so it's an easy system to disrupt because if instead we're fermenting the product uh, using yeast that's been modified to produce milk proteins, 
basically we're just dumping sugar in and getting milk out the other end. I'm simplifying. But it's a bit like brewing, which we've been doing for thousands of years. And the estimates, and we don't have exact numbers yet, is we could see about a 90% saving in uh you know, in greenhouse gas emissions and about a 95% saving in land. Although there's some caveats around there. Dan, you kind of fit in the here and now where Lenore is talking about the future, right? You're dealing with these massive dairy farms right now. And and your job is to really kind of ensure that, that um, the changes that are coming, genomic or not, are safe and healthy and good ultimately for the animal. I mean, I, I guess what where I sort of yeah, um, sort of launch off from where Lenore is is that, and and it, and it relates back to what I said right at the beginning too is that in a way, uh, I'm working from the context that we've had this ten thousand year relationship with cattle, and in some way or another, I'm betting we're going to continue living with cattle, let's say, over the next ten thousand years. And the question is, how do we do that in a really good way? A good way for the planet, a good way uh, for the farmers, and a good way for the animals themselves, as well as all the other agricultural work and the people who live in rural communities uh, that 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 work and depend uh, depend in those systems. And so, my real uh, sort of uh, primary interest is in the animals themselves and trying to understand how do we make their lives better. And often, I think we 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 think of of technology. So, for example, even this whole idea around industrialization of, of agriculture, and both you and Laura have talked about these large farms, and we think of that as sort of scary and something that's probably bad for the animals. Um, but there's other technologies which, you know, seem actually pretty good for the animals. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things on that side is that there's a lot of technology in modern dairy farms, and one is the, one of those is this uh, robotic milker that basically allows the cows to go get milk whenever they want, and it actually gives the cows a lot of agency and freedom in their lives uh, over the traditional having the farmer go milk them. And and interestingly, that's the type of technology which actually, in my experience, is really well accepted by the public. People like to see these cows on those farms, and the farmers and people, for the most part, sort of ordinary citizens and consumers seem to like that kind of technology. So I think it's an example of how, yeah, technology isn't necessarily a bad word when it comes to ag. It's really thinking about how do we use that tech in a way that's really improving the system for the animals and for the people. You both kind of bring the social science view as well to science in that um, you talk about people fear change and, and maybe they're not ready to talk about possibly, you know, drinking milk not made from from something, either even oat milk, let alone dairy milk. But now it, it feels like in this COVID world that we're living in, it almost seems like it's a great time to have those deeper discussions about our food chain supply and food sustainability um, because it's relevant now, right? That was one of the things we were worried about. I think it's very true. And we, now the one thing I do, I mean, I'm a, I'm a techno optimist. I cut my teeth in San Francisco and I'm maybe a little too optimistic and a little too front of the line on new technologies sometimes. But uh, I look at the arc of history and there is no technology we have developed that we haven't used ever. No one can come up with a good example of something. We're like, nope, not going to use that one. Um, but there is a stickiness in that we tend to also be hesitant. And it is interesting in that after pandemics, after wars, any time society is really stressed, the result tends to be then a burst of creativity. You have a bit of a golden age afterwards. And I do feel in food, it is driving trends that were already happening. Um, skepticism of long supply chains and the desire to produce things closer to where they're eaten has been emerging as something we wanted to do anyway to improve quality, to uh, improve availability. And in Canada, that means technology because it's cold here in most of the year. Somehow, almost all the year. I still haven't quite got over that. But um, what it means is we are seeing more acceptance. Also, there is um, what we sometimes in our group call the Reaper effect 
in that um, we've done studies to gauge consumer acceptance of these technologies, and it's very low among people 60 and over, and it's very high among people 25 and younger. Um, basically, the, the fear of GMOs skews very old, and that's a problem that to be honest with all technologies just kind of works through the system. And so though my mother is never going to adapt to an iPhone, my niece and nephew started on their iPhones when they could pick them up basically. And they're way better than I am. And I think that's what we're seeing. And I think if anything, COVID is pushing that faster than we expect it. Okay. But can I just look at yes. it? Um, so, and, and it shares a lot of the, the, the biases in terms of, of around pro technology. Um, but I think that other thing, another sort of feature and um, brought on partly by this, but also sort of a deeper historical underpinnings is around um, people are a little bit more skeptical of the message and the messenger and I think that feeds into this questions about, well, who's a beneficiary? It's one of the reasons why Eleanor's bringing up is like, we like the idea of buying local because actually a lot comes down to trust and who do you trust? And the, as these supply lines stretch, then, well, you know, I'm not just, I don't know the farmer. I don't, in fact, I don't even know the 20 people between me and the farmer that got the product here. Um, so I, I think that those are, those are another important element. And I think that uh, one of the things in a situation like this, when we see, uh, for example, uh, on the television screens, these issues that are happening in slaughter plants, for example, really shines a light on some of the issues around the supply chain um, and does drive the this need for, this desire for trusted relationships. I, I think there's more than one ways of getting that, of course. Um, and so that could be that you're brewing your own milk in your own kitchen, but it could also be that you're friends with the goat farmer down the road. That was yeah. what I wanted to ask both of you, because you yeah. said Canada is cold, right? We need yeah. technology here. We we can't grow our own food enough to sustain all of us in the seasons that, that we have. But there is a, a distrust of um, big companies that mm -hmm. produce kind of, you know, that I'm... I'm aging myself here when we talk about GMOs and GMO seeds and stuff yeah. like that. So are we moving back to a world, which we've talked to before, where we do literally call the farmer down the street, that kind of hundred miles? No, no, Lenore, no, not in any way, shape. Or we form. love that idea, though. It makes us feel we good. love it. As long as we're talking, we as in a certain quite wealthy subset of Western society, we think it sounds great and it is 5% of the supply chain and that's it and if we really worked if we expanded this like crazy if we trained and trained people to run small farms maybe we get it to 10 percent but it's a romantic notion and when we really look at the food system the industrial food system keeps us fed and the weird thing and the take that is starting to show up a little bit in the media is everyone standing back and saying, wow, we didn't run out of food. That's pretty impressive. This is the biggest disruption to the food chain in probably the last 200 years. And we're fine. If you go out there tonight, there is food in the restaurants, those that are open, and there's food in the grocery stores. Even the meat chain, which is, to be honest, total disaster, totally predictable, Largely, they're, you know, it should have been dealt with years ago. But I bet if you walk into Safeway today, you will find chicken, you will find beef. It might be a tiny bit more expensive. But there is a global pandemic in every country on earth. We're not starving to death. We're not rioting. And we should be applauding that this system is actually this good. Now, I'm a believer that we can create systems which are really good for the animals and the people that work with them. And I think that's a, just an important thing to keep on circling back to, too, is that um, that it's the system and the system is more than just what's in our dinner plate. It is the quality of life that 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 the people who work in that system, which can be good and bad in current agricultural systems, but we need to think about ways of making it better as well as as the effects of other systems. And I think another bit which we haven't had a chance to talk about so much, but actually is the 
environmental bit. And, and it, the narrative is often with, with ag is about, you know, you have this picture of, you know, the cattle farms and Amazonia and the rainforest being destroyed. But at that, that end, is happening, though. It, and it does happen. Yeah. That's one part of it. But the other part of it is actually the animals a very important part of many of our agricultural systems to keep landscapes most productive is to have an animal component in it. And actually, a lot of our you know our, a lot of our landscapes, the animal our landscapes just won't look like they do unless they're part, the animal's part of them. But that's <laughs> if we all had yeast farms, they wouldn't quite a, be the same. It is true, but it's poor argument. <laughs> because right now, 40% of the global surface is being used to feed us. We can't it's not sustainable. expand anymore without seriously threatening our survival. And when I look at that, your point, I always want to take it a bit to the extreme. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, okay. If I can free up 90% of that land, let, let's put the animals where they should be. Let's uh, let's yeah. get the bison I'm back on the prairies. Sure. And, you know, and I am saying I yeah. do feel yeah. that it's a process. Yeah. And the weird yeah. thing is you and I are kind of on the same yeah, yeah, side yeah. Yeah. because it's the industrial system that's maybe 70 to 80% of all the food being produced that's the problem. And we're both sort of moving in a direction. I just... Some of the arguments around the animals being a necessary part of the land, well, you, you don't need to kill them. <laughs> like, it's not a requirement. I they just taste good. That's all. I want to end both of you with this. What do you think the most important in each of your fields of expertise, um, the most important thing genomics will bring to the future of food sustainability and food systems? Um, and I, in your answer, Lenore, I, I, need, I need you to work in those mastodon gummies somehow. Oh, yes. Well... Basically, aside from the little blip where GMOs got a very bad rap, and to be honest, justifiably so in some cases, but we're into a new era where we are seeing much better applications. And I think one that I'm going to throw out, just people are so surprised to hear about it, is actually on the dairy front, is uh, we reached a point at which we couldn't make enough cheese for the market because there wasn't enough rennet, which is a substance you get out of the lining of calves' stomachs or sheep stomachs, and it makes the cheese coagulate and turn into cheese. And so the solution to that problem, which was actually the first approved use of um, GMOs directly in the food chain, was to take yeast and bacteria, genetically modify it to produce a form of rennet, which we now call vegetable rennet. And about 70 to 80% of all cheese in North America is made that way. And so people are eating this every day. They obviously are not encountering great problems and it solved a terrible problem. And we would not be eating cheese the way we do if it hadn't been for that technology. Now, fast forward, I think what we're gonna see is we're gonna see a lot of genetic technologies being used to improve existing foods and when I talk about cellular taking over, I mean, it's hundreds of years. We're going to have those, that blue cheese had better be around for a while yet. I love it myself. But we also might see kind of an unstopping of the potential of what we can do. And I was in San Francisco um, meeting with people in this space, and there was a group producing gelatin um, without animal product. And they actually had a very practical reason. It turns out that medical gelatin causes allergies. It causes weird reactions because it's an animal product being introduced directly into your body in some cases. And so they were looking for an alternative and they wanted um, to create gelatin using bacteria. And they needed though an animal cell line from which to pull the DNA that makes the gelatin and they went through their cell line book and noticed Macedon was available because it has been sequenced and so that's what they chose and uh, uh, they were handing out Macedon gummy bears um, with the proviso that you know we we're taking our chances on them you know no one had eaten these in a long time and it kind of it nicely squares that circle because we hunted the Macedon to <laughs> extinction and now here it is popping up again and what it suggests to me, though, is we could get very creative with um, animal cells. And uh, we could, we have, for example, 
um, documentation of milks that were better than cow's milk, uh, but the animals are extinct. Um, stellar sea cows, for example, their milk was apparently amazing. We could maybe do that for us. And, um, you know, maybe you're feeling like some fermented mare's milk, but you don't want to go all the way to Mongolia and milk a horse, which is very difficult to do. Um, well, probably handle that with cellular. And so I think we are just on the edge of an amazing period in food. And as long as we don't cook ourselves with climate change, it could be a really great time to be eating. Dan, what do you think? So I guess what I'd like to, to sort of switch a little bit more to a meta innovation. So um, I think what is really extraordinary actually about us even being here in this room is that we're using social sciences to better understand what types of technology are likely to succeed and resonate broadly with societal values. And, and, and I think that this is, this is huge in science, right? So science forever has been about sort of, uh, you know, wise wizard on the hill coming up with some wonderful secret formula and then and then, you know, sort of imposing that on the on the peasants below. Um, and this idea that, no, we're going to, in an intentional way, work on technologies that resonate. Yeah, being, being creative, but at the same time, functioning within sort of broader societal norms, I think is a is is really important and exciting. I don't exactly know where where that'll end up. And I think the conversation sort of shows that. There's lots of potential views of the future, but I think what's exciting about where we are is we, we I think we're now much less likely to do the really sort of dumb things that we did 20, 30 years ago of developing these technologies that really nobody wanted. Uh, and, or totally uh, understood or knew mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And so I think that, so I, th 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 this is, I mean, it's important, I think, to realize that we are, this is a really a dramatically different landscape. And actually, it's, uh, this, even in science, this isn't common. And so I think we should be really proud of being in a, being able, the luxury of really being in a, in a time and a place where we have the science working together with the societal aspects. A great way to end it. Thank you so much for oh, a fascinating conversation. I <laughs> hope you'll both come back. Thank you. Oh, anytime. Yeah, that's fun. We'll, we'll find other things to say, I'm guessing. Yeah, maybe I'll bring some of that cellular ice cream if yes, I can. Yes, please. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. clears throat> Thanks.